Hey, everybody, and I'm Michael Album, and today I'm joined by Emil Shore, Tom Schneider. And today we're going to be covering some of the rules, quote unquote, associated with real estate investing. We're going to break down what they are, how to use them, and where they may and may not be applicable. So let's get into it. All right, guys. So let's kick it off, I think, by starting to talk about some of the different rules, quote unquote, that are associated with real estate that get passed around a lot. And I think one of the most common ones I hear, at least in the academy anyhow, is, is about the 1% rule. So Emil, can you give everybody a, maybe a little bit of the definition and then walk some folks through an example of how they might use that? So the 1% rule basically says you want the rent to equal at least 1% of the purchase price. So an example of that is the sales price is $100,000. You'd want the home to rent for at least $1,000. And this rule is typically seen as a good benchmark for will the property cash flow. So if it meets the 1% rule, a lot of investors say it will cash flow. Just to clarify, that's monthly rent. So it should rent for 1% monthly. So a thousand bucks a month if it's selling for 100K and that'll likely cash flow just as a very quick back of the napkin type of analysis. Yes, good clarification. Do you guys use the 1% rule? I used to use it a lot more than I currently do. I think it's a good first filter, right? So I think it's a good initial point, but I think over time you start to realize that the sales price in many ways can be just a suggestion. I'm going to talk before Michael gets to talk so I can take all the good points. Uh, I, I'd say <laughs> Classic. It's, it's, really, it's, it's really market specific. So a really important concept to think about as an investor is risk adjusted returns. So in some markets, I better hit that 1% rule. In smaller markets where I would expect it to cash flow a little bit higher, you betcha, like the 1% rule is a great benchmark. In bigger markets, I might think about, you know, it might be difficult to get the 1% rule. And if I want to buy in that market, it's just going to price me out. And maybe if I'm buying in a market, say like in Atlanta or a Dallas or one of those types of markets, it's okay to be, I, I wouldn't limit myself to that 1% rule because perhaps this is a little bit more of an appreciation play. But and on the other side of this, as I said before, like a smaller market, maybe a, a Memphis or a, possibly a Birmingham, a 1% rule would be a little bit more important. So it's very market specific on applying the 1% rule. All right, Michael, go ahead. I love what you said, Tom, about being market specific, because I think it, it is. And kind of like Emil said as well, I'll use it as a real general fl to get a flavor of the market. If I see a ton of properties that are hitting that 1% rule, I know that I can be a little bit more picky about maybe getting a bit north of 1%. And then I know that that's going to be a repeatable process. And absolutely, if it's a really established market and it's a, seen as a very safe investment, then loosening up the reins a little bit, so to speak, on that 1% rule can be great. And also a little bit of a case study. One of the best properties I've ever purchased and I own was not a 1% rule. So if you're able to see things as they can be, not necessarily as they are today, like Emil mentioned, the sales price being just a suggestion, uh, there can be some real opportunity to pick up some pretty amazing deals. And so we talk about this in other episodes and looking semi-long term or more long term for some opportunities for value add. And so under market rent is a perfect example of where you have an opportunity to add value and maybe take a property that isn't 1% on the surface and transforming it into a 1% property, whether that's a reduction in the purchase price or an increase in the rent, whether day one or when the lease expires. So there's some real opportunities here. It doesn't have to be a 1% rule when you buy it in order for it to be a 1% rural property uh, as you own it. You make a great point, Michael, about talking about there are different types of rent, right? There is the current rent if it's already occupied, then there's the market rent at what it would rent for. When you're evaluating the 1% rule, what's the right rent bucket to choose to say, okay, this is a 1% property? Yeah, it's a really good question. I think I like current market rent because, well, it depends on the lease length. So if, ah, good one, yeah. If we take our average lease length of one year and say, okay, I'm buying this property. The tenant's been in there three months. That means I have another nine months to go on that lease. Am I okay stomaching the return for that nine months, knowing full well that I'll likely be able to bring it up to market rent at that expiration date, whether with that same tenant or with a new tenant? And if I really want to see properties in the area, in the immediate area that are renting for significantly higher than, than that property, which gives me a pretty good indication that, hey, my intuition is right, all my due diligence is right, that the market rent truly is higher, possibly significantly than what's being charged here. And the other thing I always want to ask is, well, why is this rent lower? 
why are they not at market rent already? Are they low income? Are the, is the owner just mom and pop and they don't need to get market rent? They just wanted to have low vacancy. So asking these types of questions and trying to figure out, okay, well, why is this this way? And then you can really look to determine how should I be evaluating this? I love the tangents of these conversations. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. It's yeah. like, it's super, like, this is not necessarily about the 1% rule, but it's like super important, super necessary to think about. It's like, important. Yeah. yeah, it's applicable. Emil, I saw you frivolously taking notes. I yeah. don't know if that's the right adjective <laughs> or verb. It works. It works. I was taking notes. Yes. Yeah. You bring something up that I want to touch on and you keep going. And I know if I don't write it down, I'll forget it. So you mentioned knowing the rents in the market to know it's under, right? And I mm-hmm. think that's where knowing your market and paying attention and studying to know, okay, a three bed, two bath in this area typically rents for this. Mm -hmm. And then when you see things come up and the rent is under, you'll be able to quickly pick that up. Whereas maybe a newer investor in that area wouldn't. So that's where I think it pays so much dividend to really like when you choose a market to study it and know what things rent for. Yeah. I'd say property characteristics is another advantage you can have in understanding a market. For example, there's a property that I have in Pittsburgh that's a four bedroom. And literally like looking around like that, I don't know, half a mile, it's all three bedrooms. There's nothing with a four bedroom. So I know when it comes lease time, this thing has a huge advantage over other properties just because there's not very many of those types of properties. So knowing what the market rent is and seeing how that fluctuate and also having an idea like a finger on the pulse of the property characteristics of the properties in the neighborhood. Going a one step deeper in, into the characteristics of properties, I think looking at just having a very ballpark understanding of what property taxes might look like in that area can be hugely impactful as to the validity of the 1% rule. For instance, we were, I was looking at a property with a student in one metro area, and we looked at the property tax based on a percentage of the expenses and it ended up being 33%, which is huge like just yeah. it's it's a massive massive portion of the income going to to cover the property taxes so if you're looking at a property in that specific metro area you would want to be well in excess of the one percent rule just so you could cash flow so i think it's super important to highlight and, and i think we were all getting there is that the one percent rule is a great place to start but i don't use it as the end all be all yeah it's a hur- heuristic is that how you pronounce that like a, a, a I, quick I think way? so heuristic? yeah Heuristic. 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 Cool whip. (laughs) Awesome. So any final thoughts on the 1% rule before we move on? I think we nailed it. Okay. So let's go on to the 1% rules, big brother, big sister, and that is the 2% rule. So Tom, do you want to give everybody a definition of what the 2% rule is? Sure. So similar to the 1% rule, but the rent must be 2% of the total cost of the property. I think it's more applicable to multifamily and then definitely the lower purchase price homes. You know, you, yeah, you can find $40,000 homes that rent for $800. It's yeah. unlikely you're going to find a $100,000 property that rents for two grand. Right. Yeah. Those are just tougher to find. I think you nailed it. In the multifamily space, these types of properties definitely still do exist. I would say that there's many of them. And again, it's one of those things you just got to be able to see them at their potential and not necessarily as they are today. I think I gave the example a while back. I bought a fiveplex and the purchase price on that was like 130000 And the rents were, when I bought it at like twenty five or 2600 somewhere around there. So right around that 2% rule. And then we increased rents day one and did some turns. And now the market rent or the current rent on that's like 3200 a month. So that's almost a two and a half percent rural property. So these properties absolutely do exist. They are tougher to find and sometimes are in tougher neighborhoods. So we just have to make sure that you understand what you're getting into because I think it's so easy to get blindsided by this amazing cash flow on paper when in reality, the actual ownership might look very different. Yeah, that's a good point. You'll see people, you mentioned it for a single family. Like sometimes you'll see a single family home that's $40,000 and is renting for $800 $800 a month. And you're like, all right, that means a 2% rule. But like you said, those are typically in rougher neighborhoods. And, you know, sometimes people will just say, well, as long as the check clears, it doesn't matter. <laughs> and I feel like that's a ticking time bomb. Those are usually, not always, but usually the properties you hear horror stories about. From Yeah. What I'll say to a lot of people in Rooster Academy about that is, you know, there's people who have had great success with that type of investing strategy. 
But I think a, a key ingredient of that type of an investing strategy is to be super, super knowledgeable at a street by street level, like have mm-hmm. tons of local knowledge. And it's just a much more intense skill set. Otherwise, you get caught, you know, buying a type of property that's a little bit more challenging to manage than you can as a remote investor. Maybe as a local investor, that makes a little more sense. Uh, but just based on my skill set and what I'm trying to do with my investing portfolio, the 2% is not necessarily for me. I think yeah. it's also important when when anybody looks at any type of property to evaluate it and they see, oh, it's a 2% rule or, oh, it's this amazing property. You have to stop and ask yourself, why? Why is this 2% property? What am I maybe missing? What are, you know, because again, drawing that conclusion between paper and reality is so important for so many folks because it is so often vastly different. Yep. Sometimes a property will be I think, Michael, you and I have looked at this. Sometimes it'll be next to a graveyard, right? And you're like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or you're looking at a property and you're like, why is this one, the rent to price so much better than all these other ones I've been looking at? And then you pull up Google Maps and it's right across the street from a graveyard. And you're like, oh, that's why. Yeah, exactly. So it's we have to, we have haunted. to, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we have to zoom out beyond the property lines to see what's truly going on in that area, in that market. Okay, so moving on, let's talk about the 70% rule. Emil, do you want to take us through this one? No, I'm going to let you do it. All right. So I'll take the 70% rule. So the 70% rule is for all you rehabbers out there, all you flippers, all you burrers. What it basically says is that if you're rehabbing a property, you should be purchasing the property for 70% of the after repair value or ARV minus the rehab costs. So what this says is if I'm looking at this property and I estimate the after repair value to be a hundred grand. And I need to purchase it at 70% of the after repair value. I'm looking at 70 grand, but I need to also account for my rehab costs. And if I anticipate needing to put 20 grand into this thing, that means I need to be purchasing it at 50 grand. So again, this is for rehabbers, fix and flippers, burrers. If you're looking at doing any kind of value add, any type of a uh, new appraisal after work has been done, it's really important that you build yourself in some margin. And that's what the 70% rule is designed to do is give you a 30% buffer on basically a 30% margin. So that even if you miss your mark, you go over budget, you go over time and your holding costs are a little bit excess of what you anticipated, you can still make a profit. You've got to miss pretty big by, uh, but you've got to miss by 30% or not make a profit on this thing. I got some, some thoughts on the 70% rule. So one of the earlier funds that I worked at we were primarily raise money to buy and hold, but we did some strategic flips where it made sense and we adhered to the 70% rule. And I think over the life of the fund, we were pretty close to that 70%. But the challenge is with the 70% rule is coming up with that accurate construction estimate. So to be able to effectively execute on the 70% rule, you need to be really good at estimating. And I think if you peanut butter spread all the projects we did together, it was pretty it was pretty accurate but at a project by project basis there's going to be overages there's going to be under you know so my advice for those who are fix and flipping and this is probably just like the biggest like no duh tom is don't be too gracious with yourself on estimating construction that's probably not the best word i could use new liberal and saying oh yeah this will only cost this much because it won't it will go over so being very very conservative when setting your cost <laughs> estimates going into that 70%. On that note too, I would also say be very conservative on your ARVs. Yes. And because that way you can kind of double insulate yourself, but you need to make sure that you're fairly accurate enough that the deal still makes sense and that you're not, because you can turn any deal into a bad deal by just saying, oh, by being too conservative. So you want to find that sweet spot between being conservative enough, but not overly conservative. Tom, curious to get your thoughts. What do you think is harder, estimating the rehab costs or estimating an accurate ARV? I'd say rehab costs, just because ARV, you know, you, you're looking at the same information that an appraiser would be looking at, which is ultimately where your ARV comes from. Mm-hmm. And construction costs, it's like you don't know what you're going to get when you open up the walls. And I'd say you'd position yourself to, like I said, be conservative and be happily surprised when it's less and have that happen more. But at the same time, like Michael said, you don't want to price yourself out. It's a tightrope a little bit of getting that right tenor. And I'd say it's a muscle. So just going through that exercise a lot and seeing the results and being data driven. So when you're doing these projects, there's a way to measure yourself in whoever your construction estimate team is, if it's you, as the actual costs are coming in versus estimates, constantly having that feedback loop in your operations to know how far you guys were off. 
is a really key element to doing that effectively at scale. Nothing to add for me. A question I get a lot is, how do I estimate those rehab costs, Tom, that you're talking about? How do I get an accurate figure? There's so many books that have been written on that. I would say go pick up one or many or all of those. Probably not all because you'll be buried. But I think it's a really good idea. In addition to just getting general contractors to give you bid walks, get multiple bids for big projects, you'll start to get a feel and a flavor of what things cost, you know, a ballpark cost of, hey, okay, I know it costs 800 bucks to replace a water heater. It's about 1500 bucks to replace a furnace and flooring installed is 350 a square foot and drywall work is, you know, whatever, a buck 50 a square foot. So you'll start to piece all this together over time. And that the best way to do it is just with experience. I don't think there's, there's really any shortcuts you know, you can read books all day, but until you go put it into practice, it's you just got to get those reps and at-bats in. Yeah. Shout out to our friends at Bigger Pockets. I have a Jay Scott's book, actually, I'm right here. I have the same one. Me, the book on estimating rehab costs. It's, it's perfect. It's kind of encyclopedic way of looking through the different components like HVAC, electrical, plumbing. If you're interested in learning about it, like that's a good immediate investment you can make on Amazon. Jay Scott, the book on estimating rehab costs. I have that one as well. And I like it in that it at least allows you when a bid comes in and you have everything line itemed out to just reference that book and see like, is there a huge discrepancy that you can try to either negotiate or maybe that tells you that contractor is trying to swindle you. Pull a fast one. It's a good sanity check. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so let's move on to our fourth and final rule, the 50% rule. Emil, you're up. All right. So the 50% rule says the property expenses should be estimated at 50% of the income, not including any kind of debt service. So if you have a mortgage, it's not including that. It's just the expenses to run the home. Things like repair and maintenance, property taxes, insurance, CapEx reserves, property management fees as well. Yep. So if I've got a house that rents for a thousand bucks a month. Let's take our hundred thousand dollar property example. If I got a, it rents for a thousand bucks a month. That's 12,000 a year. What you're saying is I should anticipate 6,000 of that to go towards those expenses. Yeah. That's what this rule says before you account for your mortgage. So then I've got a, the, the remainder 6,000 that I've got left over. Now I've got to pay me my mortgage out of that in a hundred thousand dollar house. Yes. Dude, what's left over for me? <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> no, so so this, I mean, these are the questions that we need to be asking ourselves. And that this is the evaluation that you can do. I don't know if there's a rule for this, but I think it's really important to have a ballpark idea of what mortgages cost and what a mortgage payment looks like. So on a hundred thousand dollar mortgage at like four and a half or five percent on a 30 year fixed, I think that payment comes out to like approximately five hundred bucks a year. Excuse me, a month. So if you could just have that in the back of your mind or whatever number works for you, if you could figure it out what it is for 50 grand and just work in increments of 50, the 50% rule is really useful because you can say, okay, well, if I take six grand, that's my expenses, $100,000 house, I've got an $80,000 mortgage. So call it 450 bucks a month is going to be my, ex- my mortgage, my debt service. Now I'm left with 150. That's a three second calculation you can do on the back of a napkin if someone says, hey, I've got a $100,000 property that rents for a thousand bucks. This is not a in-depth, hard and fast rule, but it's a really, really, really quick way to just say, hey, it's about this. Okay. I'm either interested in learning more about it or it's so way off that I have no interest. Yeah. So I'm curious, do you guys actually use this one? I mean, a little bit. What I would say about the 50% rule and just thinking about OPEX or operational expenditure is you can make a major impact just on market selection. So if I'm investing in a market that has super high property taxes and super high insurance, say Florida, I'm going to be a lot closer to that 50%. It's going to be more difficult versus if I'm investing in an area that has really low property taxes and very low insurance, say like a a Georgia or maybe like an Indiana, I'm going to have my operating expenditure is going to be much lower. So a big part of those costs can be predetermined on just by market selection. With that said, some of the markets that have these higher operating expenses, like I said, like a Florida, there, there's still plenty of deals to be had out there, even with those additional overhead that you're paying with insurance and property taxes. Yeah. I guess I didn't so answer you guys... if I use it or not, but I'd say <laughs> not really. I mean, in looking at a property, I know based on the market, I, I'm going to adjust. It's Maybe it's not the 50% rule in all states, right? I'll play a unique 
it, it's the same thing talking about the 1% rule, you know, it's, it's really state by state of where you should set your expectation and baseline. So when you guys are coming up with the 50% rule, Tom, I know you don't really use it so much, but so maybe a meal for you, do you line item out what the, per- what that 50% is made up of, you know, 5% for R and M repair maintenance, 5% for CapEx, 10% property manager, or how do you think about things? Yeah. So I, I'm in Tom's camp as well. I don't really use it. And for the same reasons Tom mentioned, property taxes vary from state to state, county by county. Newer build versus older build, right? So a newer build, you may not have to account for as much repair and maintenance in CapEx. So you may not need to, like that 50% may be much smaller on newer build, whereas something older, maybe you want to account higher. So I don't really use the 50% rule. I line item everything out. And then I kind of look at it in the reverse saying just what percentage of my rent does this thing end up being? The only thing that's constant is like property management because they're taking it out of the rent, 8 to 10% or 8 to 12%, whatever it is. Everything else is more so I want to get granular on what does it actually cost, get quotes, look at tax county records to figure out what the percentage is, and then just line item it out and see what it adds up to. Well, this is good because I'm the only one who does use it. So we can oh. we can chat about it. Yeah. I like the 50% rule just as a first pass. If I'm looking at a deal, I so seldom have all the information. All I typically know is what the list price is and often what the rent is. And especially on multifamily deals, we have no idea what the operating expenses are so often because some of the agents that list these things either don't bother to or don't care to or don't know what they are. And so they'll say, here, we'll talk about it later. And so to make a first pass at a building or a property, you have to assume something, right? I don't want to let me saying, oh, I don't know, mean I miss out on a good deal. So if I assume 50%, which is, I think, a very conservative value and the deal still makes sense or the deal is still interesting, that's enough for me to continue and kind of pursue that a little bit further as opposed to saying, well, I don't know what they are. I don't have time to find those values. So let's pass on it. Fair. Good point. Good counterpoint. So Emil brought up a really great point that when he thinks about his expenses, and correct me if I'm wrong, Emil, you think about them in terms of dollars and cents, what they are on a monthly basis, and then you convert that to a percentage of rent. So let's say your repair and maintenance is 900 bucks. You'll take the $900 and divide that by the rent and determine, hey, my repair and maintenance budget line item makes up 7% of my expenses. And then my CapEx is whatever, right? Is that how you do it? Yeah. Yeah. And the, and the reason, or, yeah, <laughs> go ahead. I, I do the same thing. I do the same thing. And I think a lot of people think about it going the other way and they say, okay, well, I'll budget 5% of the income for repair and maintenance and 5% of the income for CapEx. I'm not a fan of that style of thinking because if we take this house that's in a, maybe a nice neighborhood that rents for a thousand bucks a month and you're reserving a meal, let's say that's your house and you reserve 5% of that, at the end of the year, you'll have X dollars in the pocket. Mm-hmm. If I take that same house and we move it to a really rough part of town, it might only rent for seven fifty dollars a month. And if I reserve 5% for repair and maintenance and CapEx, I'm going to have less money at the end of the year set aside for those repairs and maintenance. But to fix the roof or replace the water heater should cost the exact same amount in both of those properties. Exactly. So I'm just like you. I think about it in dollars and cents and then convert it to a, to a percentage of rent not the other way around, because that gives you a very clear picture of your expense load and says, hey, it, it really allows the big expenses to jump out at you. And that's how we were able to see on that example, the property taxes were 33% of the expense load. This is a good point, how more sophisticated investors will be more robust in the way that they're calculating their operating expense. I mean, that's a great point, Michael. Like Just doing a flat percentage of your rent on certain hard costs like that just doesn't make sense. Mm-hmm. I've seen at some of the previous funds that I worked at, we had a, a matrix off of vintage and square footage and got pretty sophisticated. And I think the more data you can use to collect to be accurately predict that OPEX, like the more value you have mm-hmm. in analyzing mm-hmm. properties for sure. No doubt, right. Tom. <laughs> 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 okay, gents, any final thoughts before we get out of here? Just remember, all these things are benchmarks that are not hard and fast rules. They're there to help you think quickly and make quicker decisions. Yeah. They're not follow this rule or else it's a bad investment. Would you guys agree with that? 
Definitely. Her, disagree. Her heuristics. Heuristics. Heuristic. Heuristics. Heuristics. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think they're very much so, you know, guiding lights to operate in between, over and under. And it's just, yeah, again, I, I use the word flavor a lot. I think it's designed to give people a flavor of what they should anticipate to see and, you know, whether or not to pursue a property hastily or not. Yeah. And I'd say one of the biggest values of understanding these heuristics is knowing what goes into the sausage, what is in the machine. We had a thread on our Slack channel of Roofstock Academy where somebody took our, we have a special uh, investment playbook where we have this Excel sheet to analyze properties. And we had a member like break down the, the Excel sheet and it was really awesome. He's like, well, I, you know, I, I took it apart and then put it back together. I, I don't know if I made it better, but now I totally understand where everything is coming from. And there is so much value in that because, you know, at the end of the day, is this, this business is about dollars and cents and knowing where the funds are coming in and coming out and those assumption. And I guess if there's one takeaway from this, like those heuristics are super valuable, but knowing what goes in to the end result of that is equally as important, more important, understand the financials. Yeah. Garbage in, garbage out, as they say. All righty. Well, thank you everyone for listening. We hope you enjoyed it and can use these rules in your investing journey. And we look forward to seeing you on the next one. Happy investing. Happy investing.